Thank you everybody for coming today. So what we're going to do today is start with a few slides, but not very many, and then dive into the database itself to show how to use it most effectively. So the first thing I want to do actually is to give you a sense of what kind of stuff that you're going to be finding in FSTA. So FSTA, um, which stands for Food Science Technology Abstracts, um, actually has a broader remit than that. So initially when FSTA was founded in 1968, it really did just focus on food science and technology, but it's expanded to include more and more information about nutrition as well. So the sciences of food and health, but we do have a whole lot of content that focuses, like the, the focus of our content is food. So, and you can look at that in terms of all sorts of different commodities, um, categories of commodities that you can see here. So we've got you know, a lot about fruits and vegetables and nuts, also a lot about various kinds of beverages, meat and poultry, um, cereals, etc. So just like you would think. Um, but if we look at this from another lens, the sources are contained in different sorts of packages. So these are the research outputs, the way in which people make their research available to others. So more than anything else, we have journal articles. So about 70% of the content is journal articles, which is similar to many other databases. But then we also have patents that are indexed in the database, as well as conference proceedings and a growing portion of books and book chapters. And then we also have theses and reports and standards. So we do have a variety of kinds of information that you find in there. And if we look at it from yet another, another angle, we have a lot of different topics and so not just the food commodities, but the commodities in terms of food safety or genetics or sustainability, um, things like packaging. Um, so things that do again, center around food, but from all different aspects with uh, research that people are doing about food. Um, and then it's important to think about what we don't have in FSTA. And so one thing that we pride ourselves on is our really rigorous screening process to keep out predatory materials. So, and this is a very real problem in today's information landscape, uh, which I think is illustrated nicely when we look at some statistics about the, the, the things that people try to get indexed in FSTA. So in 2020, we blocked nine journals from nine different publishers because we suspected that they were predatory. Um, and in a, in a really recent 12 month period, we actually blocked 60 journals from 15 different publishers or almost half of the, of the submissions that were given to us where people said, could you please index this? So if we were Google Scholar, we would have no checks whatsoever. And that kind of information is included in Google Scholar and it makes its way into some of the other databases um, that you can use. But we really, really focus on being sure to keep out the predatory unsound science. Uh, and so if you want more information about how we assess our journal, journal quality, you can go follow this link. We will share this information afterwards so that you can see what we do to keep out predatory journals. And then the last thing that I wanna show you before we jump into the database itself is just to give you a sense of how focused we are at FSTA on the sciences of food and health. So if you were to take one of these pie charts as the whole of all of FSTA's indexed material and compare the overlap that you would have with other databases or search um, services that you might use, you'll see that for instance, if you were searching Science Direct, which only contains LSV materials, you would actually miss 85% of the content that you would be able to find using FSTA. 
And likewise, if you're using PubMed, you're, you're missing 38%. At Web of Science, you're missing more than a third of the material that is actually available in um, FSTA. So that's the strength of our focus. So now let's go actually into the database itself and look at how you search it. I've logged into FSTA on EBSCOhost and depending on your institution and how many databases they subscribe to on the EBSCOhost platform, you might have something that looks a little bit different when you log in. So you can go into, you can see next to where it says FSTA, there's a, a link for choose databases. So you can click on that and you'll get the full list of databases that are available to you to search on this platform. And so if you want to replicate what I'm doing here, you would make sure that the only one you have ticked is FSTA. And then you also might go into it and say your screen looks slightly different. And that's because the library administrator can control what, what your landing page looks like. And so many will have you land instead of on the basic search, have you land on advanced search. So it might look like this, um, or you might be on basic search. Uh, those are the two most common options. And it doesn't matter. You can get to any of them that you want to. Uh, but just don't be alarmed if it looks slightly different. So I'm going to start out by showing some things that you can do in basic search. Basic search is, um, you know, a Google-like search box here, one single search box um, where you can type your words. And so you can do what's called a natural language search in here which is where you type it sort of as though you would speak it natural language um, or a sentence. So you could do something like, is caffeine, um, gotta spell stuff correctly, um, very effective as an ergogenic aid. So does it make athletes? perform better. Uh, I spelled that wrong. Um, and so I've, I've typed basically sort of a question sentence fragment there. And I'm going to search it. And I get this message here. Your initial search query did not yield any results. However, using smart text searching, results were found based on your keywords. And what this means is that the database processed what it was that I typed and it picked out what it saw as the most important word. So it skipped is, skipped very, probably skipped as an, but it, it looked at caffeine, effective, and ergogenic aid. So it, it picked out the words that were the most important ones as capturing the concepts that I was trying to look for. And you can see that it did, in this case, you know, a reasonably effective job. It's talking about the, how the effect of, of caffeine um, for anaerobic exercise and our low doses better. Um, or higher doses and things like that. So it really is, you know, capturing the sense of what I was looking for. That said, this isn't really a great way to search. It will get find your results. Sometimes it won't find you any results. Um, this one's a pretty good one, but it's still not the best way to do the searching because it's much better for you to do the searching yourself and not rely on the database for um, figuring out what you meant to say, but figure out what you mean to say yourself. So what we would do to improve this search is go ahead and sort of cut it down and figure out what are our most important concepts and just search with those. Um, and so we might, Pull it down to just our keywords. 
here. And that gets us three results. Uh, I mean, 17 results, sorry. And so we've, we've lost a lot, but some of the ones that we lost were undoubtedly not really very related to what we were looking for. But at this point, I want to show you some things about what's happening in the way that the database is interpreting the words that we type. So if we go to basic search again and open up search options, then if we go down here, we can see that the default here is Boolean slash phrase. And if there are librarians here, you'll know what that means. But if you're not a librarian, you might not know, be familiar with um, what Boolean and what phrase means. And even if you're a librarian, you might not know exactly what it is that the EBSCO host platform is doing with those. So Boolean uh, refers to Boolean operators and Boolean operators are words. There are three of them, main ones and, or, and not. So those are the three Boolean operators that we use most of the time in, in constructing searches. And the ones that we really use most of the time are the and and the or. And so when we connect terms with and, we're saying that we need the term plus the other term to appear in a, in a search. So if we search caffeine and ergogenic, then, Sorry, I'm having a hard time typing that today. If then we're saying that we need both of these words to appear in each of the results that we get back from our search. So if we do that search, we get 126. Um, so if we go back and just type it as two words next to each other, and I'm actually gonna copy this and go back again to the basic search and show the search options. A phrase search means that when you have two words next to each other, that they're, that they're searched in that order together. So if we had these without an and, then it might be that we think that it's searching it as having to have caffeine and ergog ergogenic, um, right next to each other. But when we actually search it, we see that that doesn't happen. And so there's a setting that is happening a lot of the time, unless a librarian on the administrative side turned this off, where when you type two words next to each other, they need to be within five words of each other. So it's not really a phrase, and it's not really an and search either. It's something in the middle, it's like an adjacency or an proximity search of your two words within five words of each other. So if we do this as a true phrase, then we only got one result. And if we use this little um, quick look at it, then we might be able to see where, where the two words are. I'm not seeing it here. Sometimes it's easier to see it. Okay, so here we had the two words together. So that phrase didn't really make sense as a phrase anyway. But if we look at the search history, then we can see the different number of results. So when we had our two words connected with an and, which told the database these words can be anywhere in the record. Then we got 126 results when we said that they needed to be um, within five words of each other. Then we lost about 50 results. And when we said they needed to be right next to each other, then we only got one result. So how you set up your words next to each other makes a difference for how, which results you're getting back. 
And the main thing that I want to draw your attention to is that you shouldn't assume that this option of searching where you just type two words is the same as this option of searching. So it doesn't have an assumed and in there. It has instead an assumed near five in there. So, so they need to be close to each other. So it's an easy mistake to make. And I think that it's something that, that uh, once you know that if you want to, if you don't want to keep the words close to each other, that you need to type that and in there, that you'll do a better job of searching and understanding um, why you're getting the results that you do get. So if we go back to our results, so I'll go to this set of 70, then I want to show you that you have different options here. So you can sort them by, the default is by relevance, but sometimes it's really helpful to instead search the, sort them by date. So the newest ones on top. You can also have a different result display so that you can see what you want to see. So if you want to scan just the titles, you can have that as, as the way that you see it. And then if you want to see more, you can always go to the spotlight here so that you can open up the ones that you think are might be useful where you want to look a little bit more closely. If there's a linked full text link here, then if you click on that, then that takes you to the publisher page. And sometimes it'll be an open access one. Within your library system, there will also be a link to the subscription copy if your library subscribes to the full text there so so that you can you can get the full text easily so i don't have have library copies so i only go out to the publisher page and i want to not forget to tell you that as you're doing your searching it's a good idea to add results that you think are ones that are useful for your research to this the folder so you just click on click on the little folder icon here and it gets added to your folder and you then can go into your folder and once you have you can for instance select them all and send them to yourself as an email or um, probably more likely is send it to a reference management software program like EndNote or RefWorks or something so that you save these. You can also sign up for a personal account. So and everybody can do this. So mine's already signed up, but you can create your account the first time, register for it. And then you can save these in, in a permanent folder. Um, I just want to go back to my folder. And I, I can save these in, in, my, um, in my folder to and I can categorize them there. Um, and I can share, share them with other users if I want to, um, or just keep myself organized which would be a backup if I didn't have reference management software that I used. So you can see this is Carol's folder. So I'm gonna go back to my searching though and show you some other things that we can do. So now I wanna move into some other parts of the database that you can use. So I'm gonna go into the thesaurus and the thesaur thesaurus is a really powerful part of FSTA. It, is something that improves your search, whether you use it directly or not. But I think it's really good to know about it. And there are times when you'll want to use it in a very direct way in building searches. So to get to it, you click on the thesaurus um, link here. Now, if I had multiple databases, then this would be a drop down menu and I would have the option to choose the FSTA thesaurus. But since I'm just in FSTA, then I just have to click on this. 
so here, this search box is the same as the basic search box that we were in before, essentially. But if we want to try searching the thesaurus and exploring it, then we go down to this box, which says browsing um, the thesaurus, and we type our term in here. And you can see that there's different options for how we search it. So if we keep it at term begins with, then that's basically searching it as an alphabetical list. So if we typed meat, then everything here you can see has meat at the start and there are many pages of meat. Uh, so and then we get down to mechanical. But if we change it to term contains, then we'll still have the, some of them that begin with meat, but you can see that we have some where the term contains meat in an obvious way. So chicken meat or um, pigeon meat and so forth. But then we also have some like mutton where we know it's a meat, but the word meat isn't there. So if we click on mutton, then we can see why it is that it came up as a result when we type meat, and that's in the used for uh, terms here. So when we open up any of our terms, we get to see our search term, the, the one that we selected, the source term, in its context. And its context is where it's sitting within the thesaurus. And the thesaurus is something that's organized hierarchically and relationally between terms. And so you have a term like mutton, and then you have a broader term. So this is meat specific. And then we have narrower terms. So ram carcasses, sheep carcasses, and then we have related terms, so lamb and sheep. And then we also have used for terms. So if we go to the broader terms, we can move up the thesaurus chain, so meat specific, and then a broader term above that is just meat. And then a broader term above that is animal foods. You can see in each case there's various narrower terms below the broader terms. And then the broader term is foods. And foods is the very top of that particular branch of the thesaurus. So if we go back, I'm just going to, rather than click on them all, go back to mutton. Then we can see Sheep muscles, sheep meat, ram muscles, and ram meat are all, all used for terms. And so this is one of the things that shows us the power of the thesaurus, because when a researcher refers to, say, ram muscles in their writing up of their research, then the indexers will actually capture that research and tag it with the thesaurus term mutton. So if you're doing, you're searching in the database and you search for mutton, or you go into the thesaurus and find search for, for ram muscles and it takes you to mutton, um, then all of the other researchers who've also used ram muscles work is brought together under the umbrella of mutton. So it's pulled together the different variations of terms that people use to refer to the same thing. And you can see here that we can tick next to mutton. And over here, we have another box we can tick, uh, which is called explode. And explode is quite a dramatic way to refer to saying that I want to search not just the term itself, but also its narrower terms. So in this case, the ram carcasses and the sheep carcasses. And so if we wanted to search all of those, we would just tick add and they get um, moved into our, our search box with the code DE, which stands for descriptor. 
And then we could search this and we'd get all the results where one of those three or more than one of those three uh, descriptors or the source terms had been added to the record. So if we open up a record here again, then it's useful to look at, look at it in full. So you'll know this is the title um, and the author information and the correspondence information. It's worth noting that in the records, there's normally um, the corresponding author's email address. So if for some reason you're struggling to get hold of uh, the article through other means, you can actually email the author and say, could I please have a, a copy of that article? And many authors will send it to you, not all will, but many do. And so that's a way that you can, you can legally get a copy of the article um, if, if they do respond. But you have the abstract here, and then you have these terms, which on this view of the record are called keywords, but they're the same thing as the descriptors the DE in that search box. And they're also the same thing as the thesaurus terms that we were searching in the thesaurus. And so we can see this one has both mutton and sheep carcasses. And these terms are the ones that have been assigned to the record by indexers in order to really capture the essence of what the article is about. So they're a really good way to narrow in on what it is that you're, what you're trying to search for. So if we go to advanced search, then I'm gonna show you a little bit more about what I mean with that. So I'm going to clear this search. When we go to advanced search, we have multiple search boxes and we can add more if we wanted to. I don't know what the limit is. I've never tried to click until I can't, but often two or three is enough, depending on how complicated a search you're trying to build. And the way I like to think of it is that each box is a good space for a single concept, and then another concept in the next box and another concept in the next. And you can see, we talked a little tiny bit about the Boolean operators at the start of this session and how and means that you need to have this concept and that concept in a record. So if we're using these boxes for the different concepts, then we can use or for different words to capture the same concept within a single search box. So to show what I mean, if we're thinking about a search, say um, if you're thinking about the impact of all the forest fires and climate change and smoke on wine that's being produced now, then we might have two different concepts. So one is quite broad the idea of the smoke and forest fires and, and climate change in general. And then in relationship to the second concept, which is quite specific of winemaking. So I don't know exactly what I wanna do. So I'm gonna start with a sort of a broad search. Um, so smoke or fire. And then I'm going to truncate this. So when I put a truncation symbol, which is the asterisk, and I'm saying I'd like that to be fire or fires, or it could be firestorm or whatever letters might be able to follow on from fire will be good. Or, and then I'm going to do climate change. And you'll notice I'm putting that inside quotation marks so that I'm saying climate change has to be that phrase exactly as it is. So and I'm gonna close those brackets. Now I could select the field or I could just keep it as is. I'm going to just in this case, search all the fields. So that's the title, the abstract. That also does include like the journal title and author's name. So if there's an author, 
that is like James Fire, then I may pick up their article. And then in the other box for the other concept, I'm going to search for wine and I'm going to truncate that again. And I'm going to search. So then I can start scanning my, my record. So this is still on newest, but I'm going to change it to relevance, back to relevance. And so I can see that these are seeming to be about smoke affected grapes and the effect of that on the flavor of wine. But if I were to look at it more, I'd start to be finding ones where, I think if I do go to newest, where I'm also finding results that are about, for instance, ah, here we go, more about health. So here it's something about food-induced immediate responses of the esophagus and wines. So that's, that sounds like an irritation of the esophagus due to acidic foods possibly. And the more I look, the more I might find things that are about health rather than winemaking. So one thing that is jumping out at me as I'm scanning these results is that winemaking is showing up a lot in the subject fields, which again, if I open up the record here, the subject has changed to keywords. And what I could do to focus my results a little bit more is to change this to winemaking and say that it has to be in the keywords field. And that reduces the number of results that I have, but I'll know that they're all really solidly about winemaking, which is ultimately what I'm interested in with this question. And then I could adjust this part of the search as, as seemed useful for what I was looking for as well. So that's another way in which I draw on the thesaurus to focus my search to really bring back what I'm looking for. As I'm doing searches, I can also use my limits here. So I could only look at articles that are published in scholarly peer-reviewed journals. I could just look at the most recent literature if I wanted to. Um, a note about that, one thing that we hear from our advisory board at IFAS, who are um, really prominent scholars in this field, researchers in this field, is that they see that their students often only look at the most recent literature and they miss the longer story. And so this is something that they don't really encourage people to do. It's different than health research in where you're, where you're often only look at the, the latest five years. Um, they see people repeating research a lot that's not so useful um, because it's already been well established. So we can also use these fields though to focus in on other kinds of information. So if I clear this search, I can go for instance and look at patent assignee. So you'll remember that we have a lot of patents indexed in the database. So I could look at a particular company, so Unilever, and I could just search I spelt it wrong, I think. Unilever. Oh, you know what's happened is that I need to go to new search because I have the filter on for 
peer reviewed journals. So I needed to go to a fresh search where I don't have that filter on. There we go. So, so we could, if we wanted to, then do a search for something a little bit more specific and look at the ones that Unilever has for frozen foods. And so here are frozen confections um, and packaging about them and so forth. You can also approach this from a different way. So if we clear this search, we could, for instance, look for patents about coffee or tea cups that are biodegradable. So using the structure for one box for each concept, we could type coffee or tea or beverage and truncate each of those and then cup, just in case it's cups, or container, and then um, biodegradable. So we can just do the search as is, and then we could go and do a filter here and look at the 87 patents that have been indexed about this topic. Um, and so those are some of the ways that you can do some searching within FSTA. So I wanna just take the last few minutes together to tell you about some of the other resources that we have. So for, for helping you find quality information about the sciences of food and health. So of course, FSTA, is the main way that we help people find this information. But then we've also created other resources to help researchers at different levels um, of expertise, so at different stages of the careers, find what they need. So as I mentioned at the very start of this presentation, we do a lot of work in screening the journals that get indexed in FSTA. And researchers want to make sure, of course, that they are publishing in reputable journals. Nobody wants to publish really in a predatory journal. And so we make our list available of screen journals through the Journal Recommendation Service. And it not only has the list to browse, but it has um, you know, ways to search it to match your abstract or your, your article title, proposed article title, with a good fit for submission and allows you to sort it by, for instance, open access status or see what the, the charges would be for open access and links you easily to all of their information about submitting a manuscript. We also have searching information, searching help. So on the lib guides that we have on our web pages, we have a best practice for literature searching guide, which walks you through the steps of building a really solid search. We have a guide for early career researchers for the um, process of publishing in journals. And then we also have uh, the librarian toolkit to help librarians promote FSTA so that your users get the most out of it. Complementing these, we have a research skills blog and also a feature called Ask an Expert where people can submit questions about things that they want to know about, about the research process at any level. So we'd encourage people to, to use those. So we really do hope you will engage with our resources and let us know what we can do to help you as well, because that's what we're always aiming to do. You can follow us on any social media channels that you use. So we're on all of these. And also you'll find all the information that I spoke about earlier just a moment ago on our website at ifas.org.